So today I want to talk with you a little bit about understanding others, but also about feelings. Because as a researcher who is also a psychologist, I can't really resist to talk about feelings. So try to imagine this. You're sitting in a family gathering. The weather is great. The atmosphere is nice. The food is good. You're drinking wine. Everything goes really well. People are sharing stories and experiences with each other. So you say to yourself, let's capture this moment with a selfie. You pull your camera out. And just as everybody posts the picture, your uncle suddenly gets up from the table and walks away. Everybody is shocked. People are looking at each other and wondering what is going on through his mind. Now remember that question because this is an important question we'll get back to. What is going on through his mind? So one person might say, ah, don't mind him, he's just being childish, he's overreacting. A second person might say, maybe he had a very urgent phone call and he didn't want us to know about. A third person might say, I think just before we took the photo, he was telling about something very personal and difficult he went through. Maybe he was offended or felt uncared for. So as we all try to answer that question, what's going on to someone else's mind, we apply this function which is called mentalization. Mentalization is basically seeing ourselves from the outside and others from the inside. On my work, I particularly focus on understanding and seeing others. So it's important to understand that this big word mentalization is something that we all struggle with every day. When we see a friend who seems distant, a co-worker is not cooperative, a loved one who reacts strongly to a seemingly small matter, we try to understand what is going on through their mind. So mentalization, what it actually means is the capacity to understand human behaviors in terms of underlying mental states, such as thoughts, beliefs, feelings, desires, and wishes. So for me as the therapist, to see families, couples, and individuals at the clinic, it's a very interesting question to understand what takes people from point A, of misunderstanding, to point B, of understanding, maybe even solving a conflict. And you might relate to the fact that some people are, are naturally skilled in understanding others, but what we instantly see at the clinic is that the same person can fluctuate in his ability to understand others, depending on the time, the context, the setting. So the main question is why? What makes us give a quick, maybe even a judgmental explanation to why that uncle left the table at one time, yet at a different time to give a more thoughtful, elaborate, maybe even an empathic explanation to that same behavior? You might even relate to the notion that sometimes it's like there are two different parts of our brain who are fighting over the steering wheel, who is going to decide. One of the things that literature suggests is that the ability to understand others' mental states depends on our emotional state. In simpler terms, that means that our ability to understand others may relate, may shift depending on what we feel. And we want to understand more precisely how this process works. So whenever we feel emotions, any emotion, let's take sadness here for an example, we can have different levels of it. We can be a little bit upset, maybe a bit blue or gloomy, which would indicate low levels of sadness. And we can be in despair or be devastated with something, which would indicate much higher levels of sadness. Sadness here is just an example. We can have different levels of any emotion, different levels of anger, shame, happiness, and so forth. So, and this is the million dollar question for me, how do different levels of emotional arousal help or impede our ability to understand others? And I want to discuss that through a scenario the highlight that highlights the practical implication of this question in our everyday lives. Try to picture this. You and your partner are going to have a serious talk about this topic you always have different perspectives on. Let it be educating your kids, deciding on taking a uh, move, taking another vacation, any money-related issue. And I want to ask you, and you would try and guess, this is your job now, which of the two options I'm going to present would predict better understanding of your partner, better mentalizing? So in option A, you come to this talk just a little bit upset. You say to yourself, ah, it's that same old talk, we always have this argument, we will get through it eventually, it will be okay. In option B, you come to the talk much more emotional. You're thinking to yourself how difficult it is to see this gap between the two of you, how hard it is that the two of you have such a different opinions, and you even consider what does that say about you as a couple, that you have such a different opinion in such an important manner. So in option A, we have rather low intensity of sadness, while in option B, a much higher and more emotional sadness. So I want to ask you, which of you think that option A would predict better understanding of your partner? You can raise your hand. Okay, who of you think option B would present better mentalizing, better understanding of a partner? Okay, interesting. So we want to know what our guess was? Drum roll. Neither. 
What we want to suggest, it was a three question. <laughs> what we want to suggest is that moderate levels of emotional arousal, being moderately sad in that case, would predict the best understanding of your partner, the best mentalizing. And let me explain why. When we are, when we are trying to understand someone else, going into someone else's mind is a difficult task. It's challenging. When we are overwhelmed with our pain, sadness, and hurt, we wouldn't really be able to consider someone else in our mind. On the other hand, when we are not engaged with what we feel, we don't really care enough. We don't have that motivation to do this high-load cognitive function, to see things from someone else's perspective. Being moderately sad, being moderately aroused, would put us in an ideal place so we can feel the pain about what happens in a way that really try makes us to try hard at going into someone else's mind without that being too overwhelming or too little to care about. So this leads us to our main hypothesis, which is first, that moderate levels of emotional arousal would predict the best mentalization, other folks mentalization. And second, we are also interested to see what happens in various emotions, because I talked about emotional arousal as the general term. But we are also interested to see what happens in sadness as opposed to anger. How does sadness affect mentalization? How does anger, what happens in different emotions, shame, happiness, and so forth? Those are the two main questions I uh, focus on my work. And so to study this, we needed the context of conflict in therapy, where people have uh, a struggle and difficulties to see things from the perspective of their loved ones. And this conflict had to be highly emotional and highly disturbing. For that reason, we took family therapies for lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer young adults and their non-accepting parents. So what we have is parents who are rejecting or disapproving of their young adult sexual identity. They come to therapy to work on that relationship. Those sessions are then videotaped, and we have research assistants who watch the video, and they give a score for every time a parent referred to his young adult. They get a score for mentalization. Then a different group watch the same videos, and they give a score for emotional arousal. And then we can look at those two factors in live videotape sessions and see what's the association between the two of them. Now I want to give you just a taste of how does our data look like. So this is how we collect the data. We have a table. It has every relevant 30 seconds gets a score, only when parents talk about the young adult. It gets a score for mentalizing, gets a score for emotional arousal. And I want to show you a specific example. Here is, it's a father who talks about his young adult, and he says, maybe he thinks that, and then he pauses. Well, I don't know what he thinks. He's just overreacting. So he would get a one for mentalizing here, because he's not really trying. He's beginning to try and then stops. He would get a five for his emotional arousal, and that is based on his tone of voice, emotional gestures. And then we can see the same father at a different time, where he says, for him, it might be related to a bigger issue between us. He's left alone with something which is quite big and difficult. Here, he would get a three for mentalizing, which is much higher. He would get four for his emotional arousal. Again, based on uh, coders that score his emotional tone, his way of speaking. And this is how we collect the data. So the good news I can share with you is that we recently published a pilot study confirming our, our hypothesis. And through analyzing over 40 videotape sessions, we indeed found that moderate levels of emotional arousal predicted the best parents' mentalization towards the young adult. That takes us to our next step, which is first to replicate those findings in a larger data sample, which much more videotape sessions. And second, and more importantly, we are now working on a more controlled lab experiment. In that experiment, we will have people participate in talking about in conflict, and we will measure their physiological arousal. We will measure their heart rate, their sweat gland activity, and now we can see if we find the same link between mentalization and arousal when we look at physiological arousal and not just observationally, people watching the video in code. So to conclude, how does that help us? So first, it means if those hypotheses are confirmed and replicated, I, as a therapist, would act different working with my clients. If I'm working with a father who is overwhelmed with his emotion, or maybe even not connected to what he feels, I would avoid from asking him about his son. I would maybe first downregulate him, or help him to connect to the pain about the relationship, but not too much, but only then invite him to think about his young, his young adult mental states. And second, which is relevant to all of us also outside of the therapy room, and I invite you to try and consider that more often, whenever you are struggling to understand someone, try to put that into the equation. Where am I emotionally? Am I too high? Am I too low? Try to see if that might get in the way for you to understand someone. Because at the end, we all want to better understand others, but also to be deeply understood by them. Thank you. <laughs>